Tonight's uh, lecture concerns itself with Abaye and Rova. Abaye and Rova are different than any of the other pairs that we have had uh, in our discussion of the great men of the Talmud. So we have uh, many uh, pairs, Hillel and Shammai and Rav and Shmuel, uh, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Tarfon, Rabbi Shmuel. We have many people that were colleagues that were at the same time. But there's no one like Abaye and Rova. Uh, Abaye is mentioned over 1177 times in the Talmud. And Rova is mentioned even more times in the Talmud. And there is a tradition that, uh, in the Vilna Shas at least, uh, that you could go no more than three pages in any tractate without finding the names of Abaye and Rova that would appear. And the Talmud itself calls itself after Abaye and Rova. It, it names itself Havayos the Abaye of Rova. The discussions, the debates, the occurrences of Abaye and Rova. So Abaye and Rova symbolize the Talmud as no other uh, two people who are recorded in the Talmud do so. And uh, Abaye and Rova are also different in the fact uh, that uh, they knew each other as children. They were lifelong friends. Everybody else that we meet met each other later. They grew up in different environments. They came from different places. Uh, they didn't know each other in their youth. They only knew each other when they reached maturity or when they began their uh, careers as scholars. Abaye and Rova went to Cheder together. They went to the same class together when they were small children. The Gemara tells us that they sat by Rabbi Bar Nachmeni, who was Abaye's uncle. We'll discuss that in a moment. And uh, they were uh, four or five years old. And uh, Rabbi said, where can you find God? Where is the HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Where can you see God? And uh, Abaya pointed to the roof, and Rova went outside and pointed to the heavens. And Rabba Barnachmeni said, I see, I guarantee that I have here two future great scholars in Israel because of the fact that the Talmud tells us that you can tell how the tree will grow from its uh, beginning uh, trunk, just how it starts. You can tell how the gourd will be from, by cutting the, uh, the uh, stalk itself. So too, uh, they in their youth already exhibited, in their very early youth, exhibited the fact that they would be great Torah scholars and that they would search for God. It's not accidental that Abaya said the roof and Rova said he went outside and he pointed to heaven. Uh, every partnership, so to speak, has an inside man and an outside man. All right, there's the person that runs the business on the inside and the person that the salesman works on the outside. We could say that Abaye is the inside man and Rava is the outside man. We'll see uh, that Rava has much more to do with the community. Rava has much more to do with non-Jews. Rava has to do with the government. And Abaye is in the yeshiva, and that's where he is. The, uh, the tune, the melody of learning Gemara is Omar Abaye. Abaye says, and so uh, that the people should live, we're talking about Abaye is born in 267 of the common era, 277 of the common era. He dies in 337. So we're talking about uh, being able to live 1,800 years, and if you walk into any yeshiva in the world today, Svardi, Ashkenazi, Yemenite, uh, Hezder, uh, pre-army Mechina, uh, you name it, you'll sit there for five minutes, you'll hear Omar Abaye. Abaye says, he's still saying. Omar Rova, Rova is still saying. And there, there no, nobody in the history of the Jewish people has so captured what Torah is as these two people. Even Bialik, uh, who uh, 
had left the yeshiva and really left traditional Jewry, uh, but always had such a strong longing for it. He never found himself afterwards. That's one of the terrible things about leaving <coughs> is that afterwards uh, one finds it very hard to find oneself. Uh, the uh, the uh, the altar from Slabotka, Reb Nosson Tzvi Finkel, the head of the Slabotka yeshiva, said once, he said, listen, they come to Slabotka, I cannot guarantee that there'll be a scholar, I cannot even guarantee that there'll be a Shomer Shabbat, I cannot guarantee that they'll be religious. There's one thing I can guarantee, they won't enjoy this world anymore. <laughs> and there's a great deal of truth in that. So uh, uh, Rava and Abaye, uh, uh, Ab uh, Bialik's famous poem about uh, the Matmid, about the student scholar who stays up all night and studies, the refrain in the poem is, Omar Abaye, oi, Omar Rava, oi, because that symbolizes it. That's, uh, that symbolizes uh, the Talmud and all of its learning. Abaye is a strange name, not a Hebrew name at all. So what, what is the name? So there are two different opinions in the Rishonim. One opinion is he, Abaye was an orphan. His father died before he was born, and his mother died in childbirth. She gave birth to him. His father's name was uh, Belul. You know very little about him. Abaye was the only child of, that the parents had. And uh, he uh, was raised by his uncle, by Rabbi Bar Nachmeni. And Abaye in the Talmud is called Nachmeni. So there are two opinions. One opinion is that his real name was Nachmeni, and they called him Abaye because he was an orphan. Because the uh, acrostic of Abaye, Aleph, Beis, Yud, Yud, is the acrostic of the verse, Asher Becho Yerucham Yatom. In you, God, does an orphan find consolation. And therefore, it was almost a tradition that when a child was, God forbid, an orphan from both parents, they called him Abaye. That's one opinion. The other opinion is that his real name was Abaye, but they called him Nachmeni. After Rabbi Bar Nachmeni, who, uh, after the grandfather, uh, who he shared. And the reason they called him uh, Nachmeni, uh, the Gemara says, the reason they called him Abaye, they say rather, is because Rabbi didn't want to call him Nachmeni because that was his father's name. And his father apparently was still alive. So he didn't want to call him by his father's name. So therefore he called him Abaye. And the name stuck. And that became the name that he was known for uh, forever in the yeshivas. There's a third interpretation already more scholarly for modern scholars. It doesn't have the geschmack of Asher Becho Yerucham Yosom. But the, uh, the, that, that Abaye is really a... Uh, a Syrian name, which means to be a comfort. And therefore, that's why it's a Syriac form of the Hebrew name Nachmeni. But in any event, that was Abaya's name. And he uh, grows up in the house of Rav, in the house of Rabba, Rabba, Rabba bar Nachmeni. Now, uh, <coughs> Rabba was a young man. Rabba was in his 20s when Abaya was born. But Rabba becomes one of his two main teachers. And Rabba takes him uh, wherever he goes. And he was raised by Rabba's wife, by his aunt. And therefore, in the Gemara, we always find that he says, Omer Liam, my mother told me. He doesn't mean his mother. He means the woman that raised him. And he always quotes her, uh, especially in matters that have to do with practicality in life with practical matters. So he always says, Omer Liam, my mother told me this, my mother told me that, and that's where I know it from. 
at the time uh, when Abaye went to the yeshiva, the main yeshiva was in, already in Pumpadisa. We discussed last week Sura and Nahardoya, the yeshivas of Rav and of Shmuel. Those yeshivas declined after the death of their great leaders, and the center of learning moved to Pumpadisa, which is a city on the uh, a Tigris River in Iraq. Now, in Pumpadisa, uh, they were very, the Jewish community there was known for its uh, uh, business practices, was known for uh, uh, being, uh, it was a very, uh, I don't know how to put it, it was a luxury minded, uh, wealthy community. Uh, business was more important to them than anything else. Uh, the, therefore, the Russian yeshiva in Pumpadisa had very harsh things to say about their uh, compatriots in town because they felt that they did not respect Torah and they did not really, as all uh, heads of the yeshiva can testify, they did not really support the yeshiva as they should have. And uh, therefore, uh, they were very tough people against them. Uh, and uh, Rabba, who was the head of the yeshiva, uh, he did not hide his feelings. He spoke to them often about the fact that their business practices were unethical, unacceptable. Well, people don't like to hear that. Especially the next day you come and ask them for money for the yeshiva. <laughs> and therefore what happened was, there's a famous statement in the Gemara that Rabbo said that uh, he was talking to Abaye. So he said that uh, when, uh, when the time comes that, to eulogize me, you should, you know, I should be eulogized very powerfully. So that people will weep, people will, uh, because, and you should do a good job because he said, I will be there. So Abaye, Abaye is a, is a very mischievous uh, person. The Talmud tells us that he was a juggler. He could juggle eight eggs in the air at one time. He used to do it on Cholomoy and Sukkot and the same Chatzbeis HaShoeva. He would juggle eight eggs at one time. The Gemara doesn't tell us how many broke, but, <laughs> but, that, that, but that he was famous for that. He was also famous for having uh, quick remarks, a sharp sense of humor, uh, to the extent that his rabbeim uh, were, uh, were somewhat critical of him uh, because of the fact that he was, uh, he was too lively. Yeah, and, but he said, Gilu Biroda, he said, you don't have to worry about it. I, uh, my rejoicing is always with fear of God. So the Rebbe said to him, how do you know that? He says, because I wear it filmed all the time. I go now no the manach tfilin. I always wear tfilin. If a person that always wears tfilin is aware the, of God over him, so my rejoicing is rejoicing within the confines of Torah and within the confines of Jewish life. It's not just being uh, mischievous. But in any event, Abaya said to him, "Listen," he said, "When you die, nobody in this town is going to cry for you." You're so tough on them. <coughs> and not only that, he quotes in the, the Gemara says that at the hesped of a person, you could tell whether the person's a ben olam abba. If people weep, if people feel that the person is being missed, so then there's the probability is that the person is a person who has achieved immortality. He said, when you go, man mircham alai, who's going to care? Nobody's going to know, you know. So he answered him, he said, if you and Rav Chonon, the other student, miss me, that's sufficient. And don't need that the town will miss me. If you will miss me, that'll be sufficient. And Rabbo was his rabbi. Abaya was a Kohen and Rabbo was a Kohen. They both came from, they were descendants of the house of Eli, Eli a Kohen. Now there was a curse on the house of Eli a Kohen that they were not long lived. They did not live long. Uh, so Rabba dies, he's 40 years old. But Abaya lived to 60. 
So the Gemara asks, how come Abaye lived till 60 if Rab only lived till 40? The Gemara says, because Abaye did great amount of gemilas chasodim. He did a great amount of charitable acts. Abaye supported 200 students in his yeshiva from his own pocket, even though he was a poor man. And therefore, the Talmud says that if a person is uh, engaged in helping others, and so then uh, the genetic uh, problem, so to speak, is modified. And that the person that uh, can add years to one's life by Gemilas uh, Chasodim, by doing good things on behalf of other people. So Abaya lived till 60. Abaya was the Rosh Yeshiva, we'll discuss that when uh, he had a second Rebbe. The first one was Rabba in Pumpadisa, the second Rosh Yeshiva in Pumpadisa was Rav Yosef. Now Rav Yosef was a great Talmud Chacham who uh, uh, had a tremendous memory and who unfortunately became sightless uh, in the midst of his career. Again, if you read the Gemara, you see that everything happened to these people. But, that, but they're such remarkable people that almost nothing ever deflects them from their purpose. And because he was sightless, uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the, the Talmud describes that he always had to have people uh, read in front of him. And uh, Abaye and Rava both were his Talmudim. They both were his students. And they studied under him. At the end of his life, he not only became sightless, he started to lose his memory. So when he lost his memory, so he would say something and they would have to correct him because he would say the same, the wrong thing. But the way, the way they did it, Abai always used to say, but Rebbe, you once taught us this and this. He didn't say, you know, you forgot. He said, you once taught us this and this and this. And Rev Yosef would then remember and he would say, yes, what I taught you is correct. But they never confronted him directly and said, and they never stopped him from uh, delivering the lecture or saying the shear. They never said, well, you know, it's, up, it's over with. And so uh, in that way, they certainly uh, prolonged his life and, uh, and gave him uh, an opportunity to learn. When he died, when Rav Yosef died, so Rabba died first and then Rav Yosef died, so now the uh, yeshiva in Pumpadisa was without a head. And there were four candidates for the position, including Rova, or four people that were candidates for the position. And the question is, whom should they appoint? And they, uh, they agreed that Abaye should be appointed because he was the greater scholar. It's interesting, he was the greater scholar, but the halacha is almost never like Abaye. We find this in the Talmud many times, that because a person was the greater scholar, doesn't necessarily mean that the halacha, that the law, or that the rabbis would follow his opinion. Because sometimes uh, intellectual ability and scholarship and knowledge uh, still don't hit the mark. And uh, therefore, in all the disputes between Rav and Abaye, and the hundreds of disputes between them that are mentioned in the Talmud, the halacha is like Abaye only in six places. Only in six cases, Yal Kagam, which is the, uh, the simon, the, uh, the acronym in the Talmud for the six cases where uh, we follow Abaye's opinion. Otherwise, we always follow Rova's opinion, even though Abaye was recognized as being uh, a greater intellect and he was uh, recognized as being... Uh, Oker Horim, that he could, you know, take mountains and move them and grind them together. His powers of reasoning were enormous, uh, but uh, nevertheless, the halacha wasn't like him. Also, the Talmud says that, and as happens many times, that the, a great scholar or a great genius, many times doesn't, it's hard for the students to uh, relate to the person. It's hard for them to sit in his class. It's hard for them to hear the shear from him. And we find Ravada Barava says in a, uh, in a uh, almost a, 
uh, really a, an, an amazing statement. He said, instead of chewing on bones by Abaye, why don't you come and eat meat by Rava? By that he meant that, uh, that, by, that by Abaye, you have to, it's like sucking the marrow bone. You got to suck it out. It's not clear. It's not easy to understand. And Rava sets the table for you, right? That's very easy to understand. And so you should come and learn by him. Nevertheless, uh, Abaye was the Rosh Yeshiva in Pumpadissa for 14 years. And during his time, the Yeshiva grew. Rova, who uh, was not appointed the Rosh Yeshiva, Rova was born in a town called Machoza. Machoza is, is on the Euphrates. It was a Jewish town, but it was a town that was known for... Uh, uh, black marketeers, uh, the, all of these people lived in, in a bad neighborhood. Uh, thieves, etc. And uh, the Gemara says that the people of Machosa, they called them the people of Gehenna. That was the name that they gave, that was their popular name. And his father, Rav Yosef, Rovah's father, Rav Yosef, uh, had an established business. Abaye is poor, or he begins poor at least. So he became, begins both as an orphan and later on in life as a poor person, he doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have uh, uh, any uh, wealth or backing behind him. So the Gemara says that he would learn all day and that he would work at his fields during the night. He was a sharecropper. And that uh, he uh, had to uh, divide his day that way in order to be able to survive. Later in life, Abaye became more successful. He went into the wine business. Rova also sold wine. He also uh, eventually was able to have uh, fields that belonged to him and that he himself had workers that worked the fields. But during the entire 14 years that he's the Rosh Yeshiva in Pumbadisa, he is uh, without salary naturally from the Yeshiva. That, wasn't, uh, that never was a, a paying job, even though he devoted his life to it in all practicality. Abaye is married twice. Uh, his, uh, his first wife uh, uh, died. Uh, again, he had tragedy. His first wife died very shortly after they were married. They never had children together. His second wife, however, was a uh, very beautiful woman. Uh, a woman that was uh, known for her beauty, and she was much younger than he was. And he had a number of, they had a number of children together. We know of two sons of his that are mentioned in the Talmud, Rav Bibi Barabaye and Rav Shimi Barabaye. And we know that he had a daughter, the Talmud tells us a story about his daughter, and it seems that he may have had another daughter as well. Uh, but she was a, an extremely beautiful woman. And she was such a beautiful woman that when Abaye died, and she was much younger, so she was available again. So uh, the wives of the rabbis uh, like ran her out of town because uh, one of them said to her, like this, because Abaye was her second husband also, they said to her, you killed two already, we're not going to let you try for a third one. The Gemara puts it that strongly. Uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> Abaye had uh, uh, children and grandchildren and has descendants, uh, Kohanim, the uh, family of priests. And uh, he uh, uh <coughs> eventually, as I mentioned, uh, was able to uh, make a living for himself, and not only make a living for himself. So he said Rav Yosef, his predecessor in the yeshiva, supported 1,200 students because he was a man of wealth. The Rosh yeshiva was expected to, say, to provide the stipend for the students. That was how the yeshivas worked. Uh, and, what, and what they did, and that's how they worked in Europe also until... Uh, uh, yeshivas changed and began supplying meals or dormitories. But for instance, in Valozhin, in the yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva gave everyone a stipend, uh, three ruble a week, five ruble a week, whatever. And then the student was expected to rent his own room 
which they did from the Jews in the town. So it became like a university town that lived off the yeshiva. And the yeshiva also, uh, the student was also expected to have meals many times prepared in the house where he rented the room or there were women that would cook meals and the uh, young men would come to eat there as well. Those that were wealthy, those that came from wealthy families, so the yeshiva gave them no stipend. They were expected to support themselves. See, that was the same system that was in Iraq and Babylonia a thousand years earlier. More than a thousand years earlier. That that was the system. In our time, the system has changed. In our time, it's, it's reversed that the, the student has to pay the yeshiva and that the yeshiva is supposed to provide meals and rooms, though there are yeshivas here, Brisk, and a few other yeshivas that still have the old system, that they provide nothing, and that they do give stipends, <coughs> and to those who don't need the stipend, then they don't give. Uh, my father, uh, he should live and be well, told me that in uh, 1929 yet, in yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchel Chonan in New York, uh, Dr. Revel, uh, who was mentioned in an article about me this week. Uh, so he uh, uh, would give stipends to the boys that he felt needed it. And uh, he would give it out of his own personal pocket because Revel came from a wealthy family. He was married into a wealthy family, an oil uh, family from Oklahoma. And so he would continue uh, this tradition of uh, supporting uh, scholars in the yeshiva uh, by giving them money and then they would uh, be able to rent rooms and they would be able to uh, buy food uh, and live. So that was the system in Pumpadisa in uh, the year 250. And Abaye supported 800, I'm mean, sorry, it supported 200 and the previous Rosh Yeshiva supported 1,200. So Abaye said, you know, uh, these young men have the poor fortune of having a poor Rosh Yeshiva who cannot afford more. But previously we could afford to support 1,200, now we can only support 200. Abaya said that ruefully, the famous statement in the Talmud, Bosar Anya Azla Aniyusa, after poor people, poverty follows them. So, so in that he meant a few things. First of all, a person who was once poor, so to a certain extent always remains poor even when he has money. He can't get out of the mindset of poverty. And he also meant that the poor people are schlamazels. That uh, whatever they do, you know, the mazel doesn't always turn out for them. And therefore, boser anya, after poor people, azel anya the poverty follows in their wake, always brings them there. Both Abaya and Rova also uh, were sick most of their lives. Uh, it was a, a common sickness. I don't know whether it was brought on by parasites in the area or something, but we find that most of these great people suffered from a form of colitis, a form of uh, intestinal disease. And therefore, uh, uh, the, the Talmud tells us that Rava was cured by uh, an Arab woman that gave him a potion made out of dates. But they, uh, they, they were people who suffered their entire lives with, with illness. But again, it's not reflected in their personalities, nor is it reflected in their words in the Talmud, even though the Talmud describes it for us uh, in, a, uh, in a certain fashion. So Rava... Uh, after uh, Abaye became the head in Pumpadisa, Rova goes back to his old hometown of Mechosa. And in Mechosa, as I mentioned, it's not a very hospitable place for Talmud uh, HaChomim, for yeshiva. Nevertheless, he founds a yeshiva, and his yeshiva becomes immensely successful because Rova has an outgoing personality, even though Rova is a very sharp person. The Talmud tells us that many times Rova said something to somebody and then he had to come and apologize. Uh, Rova is a, uh, he doesn't mince words, but his, uh, his yeshiva becomes very successful. Now Rova's a wealthy man. His father was wealthy. 
inherited money. Uh, there was a gear in town uh, who died, and since the gear, the convert had no heirs, so all the money he left, he gave to Rova. So the Gemara says it was 12,000 uh, gold coins, which at that time was a fortune of money. Uh, Rava was in the wine business. Rava also ran a ferry service across the Euphrates River. And Rava also had ships that transported goods up and down the two main rivers of Iraq. And so he was a very wealthy man. Since he was a wealthy man, so he could afford a big yeshiva. And therefore, to a certain extent, we can understand why his yeshiva was popular because of the fact that you were very well supported when you came to the yeshiva. Rova had the wealth and he expanded it on the yeshiva. Since he was a wealthy man, he also had contacts. He had contacts in the non-Jewish world and he especially had contacts in the government. And uh, he, the uh, Talmud tells us that there was a queen uh, <laughs> Talmud calls her a queen uh, with that district, that she uh, was most impressed by Rava. And she said, he's a holy man, he's a wonderful man. And her husband said, I mean, what are you so enamored of this Jew? So she said, well, in heaven they do whatever he says. So he said, I don't believe it. So she came to uh, Rava and she said, Listen, I'm in trouble because I said, you know, that you're a miracle man and that in heaven they listen to what you do. And my husband, who's the king, says he doesn't believe it. And if he gets angry and disproves, you know, he could kill me, he could kill you, he could, all sorts of bad things could happen. So he said, well, what did you say that I could do? She said, well, it's in the middle of the month of Tammuz, we're coming into it now. Make it rain. Well, it's hard enough in our land to make it rain in the middle of Kislev, let alone in the middle of Tammuz, right? That we find in the Tanakh that Shmuel Anovi uh, counted it as one of the great miracles when he, uh, when he uh, told the Jewish people that it, they were going to have a king and that he was no longer going to lead them, etc. And one of the things that he did to impress them was he made it rain. He said, Alok Tzir, it's the harvest time of the wheat and here in the summer and you'll see we'll have a rainstorm and that was considered a miracle so she said so you got to make it rain so Rova prayed and it rained so everyone was properly impressed that night the Talmud tells us uh, you know as only the Talmud can tell these stories uh, that night uh, Rava's mother appeared to him and she said, in heaven they say you're a nudnik. You keep on, bo you keep on bothering them. Why do, they don't, why do you bother them? They, don't, what, they have to make it rain for you in the middle of Tammuz. They have nothing else to do up here. You have to promise me you'll stop that. And from then on, Rava no longer proclaimed himself to be a miracle man. Uh, he no longer uh, uh, attempted to... Uh, enlist the aid of heaven. I mean, that's a typical Talmudic story, though, you know, because uh, the, the, whole, uh, the, the whole thing is captured in this, uh, in this anecdote. Rava, uh, <clears throat> because of his wealth and his connections with the government, was able to do wonderful things for the Jews. He was able to uh, have favorable decrees. Uh, he was able to have an influence. Uh, he was able to uh, ameliorate uh, any uh, problems that the Jews had. And this really is the golden period of the Jews who lived in Babylonia because at this point in the uh, third and fourth centuries, uh, the land of Israel, as far as Jewish life is concerned, closes down. The Byzantine Christians begin to appear uh, they're out to destroy the Jewish people, literally to destroy the Jewish people, commit genocide. If it would not have been uh, for the Muslims who came in the beginning of the 7th century, they probably would have, uh, at least they thought they would have been able to achieve their purpose. So the Lord sent them the Muslims to take care of them, and they're still working on it. And uh, So Eretz Yisrael closes down. Now Abaye says 
the, the Talmidei Chachomim in Eretz Yisrael are greater than the Talmidei Chachomim in Bavel. He said, one of them is equal to two of us. But, he says, what can we do? There's no Eretz Yisrael anymore. The great uh, Torah centers after Rabbi Yochanan, Reish Lokish, and Tveria, the great Torah centers have been shut down, and the, uh, there was a great immigration, emigration of Jews from the land of Israel, most of whom went to Bovel and came into the yeshivas in Bovel. And so therefore Bovel became central in all Jewish life and it was the main center, it would remain the main center for the next 800 years. Uh, that uh, all the Torah came from Bovel and all the Jewish leadership came from Bovel and uh, the, the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud became the Talmud and not the, the Talmud that was written in Eretz Yisrael. And uh, so therefore Abai and Rova to a certain extent represent the golden period. They also represent the golden period because by their, by their time already uh, most of the Mishnah and most of the Breitot, all of the pieces of the Talmud were already in place. And therefore they like summed it up. And in their discussions and their disagreements and well, whatever they uh, uh, brought to the fore, that's the summation not only of Abaya and Rova, but that's the summation of about 500 years worth of effort in the development of Torah Shabal Peh. It would be another 200 years to really 300 years almost until the Talmud reached its final form. But after Abaya and Rova, it is really just a job of uh, fine-tuning, of assembling. Uh, the, the main structure is completed in the time of Abaya and Rova. And that's why it's another reason why the Talmud is called Havayas the Abaya and Rova, the discussions of Abaya and Rova, because they are the ones uh, who created uh, the Talmud as we know it today. They're the ones that had that... Uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that uh, ability to do so. Uh, Abaye, uh, the Talmud tells us that every Arab Shabbos, uh, he had uh, the uh, he had a voice from heaven come to wish him Shabbat Shalom. Rova only had it Arab Yom Kippur. So Rova felt badly about it, that Abaye should have, uh, you know, a heavenly greeting every week, and he only has it once a year. So in heaven, they told him, listen, Abaye is not popular in this world, and you are. So it's enough for you. And the, your popularity in this world, you know, that's enough for you. So if we come once a year to you, it's all right. Abaye is not popular, the aloha is not like Abaye. People say that they don't understand Abaye is sheer, Abaye is a poor person. Abaye, we got to come every week to, get to, to, uh, to give him a Shabbat Shalom. You, you know, you have people here like you, it's all right, so you can stay, it's not a problem. Rova uh, was, a, uh, was very popular in Machoza. The Gemara tells us an interesting story. Uh, there were many, many Geirim that lived in Machoza. There were many non-Jews that converted to Judaism in Machoza. For whatever reason, the, the Gemara doesn't explain what the reason was. And at that time, there was a halachic discussion about whether a Geir can marry the daughter of a Kohen. So a great rabbi came to town and he's speaking to an audience, apparently he was unaware that there were a lot of gerim in the audience. And he said, a ger is usur be kahanis. A ger is not allowed to marry a kahanis. He said, the uh, ger should marry a mamzeris. Which is a halach in Kedushin. A ger is allowed to marry a mamzeris. So he said the drosha on sukkis. So the Gemara says they all stood up and they threw their asrogim at him wanted to stone him with their esrogim. The price of esrogim must have been more reasonable then. 
So Rova said to him, how do you say such a speech here? This is not the place to say the speech. So Rova got up and he said, the halacha is that a ger is mutter to marry a kahanis. And the halacha is that a ger is mutter to marry a mamzeris too. And he said, you pick which one you want to marry. Whichever one you want to marry is okay. So ever, all the gerim applauded Rova. So Rova was very popular in town. And many before him say that's the reason that the ger that died left him a lot of money is because of the fact that he promoted gerim. But it's not that Rova did it for popularity. Rova held a halacha was like that. The only thing is, he, see, Rova was a very uh, astute person in knowing what audience he was addressing. He saw what happened with Rav Yosef and Rabba when they addressed the audience in Pumpadisa and constantly gave them Musr and Musr and Musr to the extent that at the funeral they were not sad that he, that they, that he died, Rabba. So he realized that uh, that's not necessarily the way you're going to win friends and influence people. If you keep on pounding on them, uh, that's not going to happen. And therefore, he did it differently. And uh, Rova was well known and very, very popular in the community. He always tried to uh, ameliorate problems, tried to help people. He was a public person. And that's what it meant that he went outside and pointed to, to the sky, right? He was an outside person. And in his uh, uh, creation of Mechoza, he transformed Mechoza into a famous city of Torah, a city that previously was known as a city of Gehenna. Uh, Rova said many, Rova is a staunch, the thing that bothers Rova the most, and Abaya also, you see it, is the lack of respect for Talmidei Chachomim that the Jewish people have. <coughs> So lest you think that our problems are now, right? It's all, we, you know, we are, we are always struggling with the same idea of Kovod Torah. So Rava said, Hane Imshe Tapshoi, these foolish people, that when they take out the Sefer Torah, everybody runs to kiss it. They stand up in front of the Sefer Torah, the Sefer Torah is holy. And a Talmud Chacham, who is a living Sefer Torah, they don't get up for him. They're not interested in him. So he said, foolish people. And uh, Rav also said that he never understood the people of Mechoza. He said, because twice a year the Yarche Kala was in Mechoza. Now the Yarche Kala was in the month of Ador and the month of Elu. And there the Talmud Chachomim gathered from all over uh, the Middle East to hear shiurim in the yeshiva in Pumpadisa and in Mechoza for a month's study. And they left their families, they left their businesses, and uh, tens of thousands of people came to the Archekala. The Gloria says that when they stood up from the shear, the dust from the feet, you had a, pil a pillar of cloud that you could see uh, a pillar of dust that you could see for miles. So he said twice a year they see the Kovod Torah. They see how people sacrifice themselves for Torah. How people are willing to give up everything to come for a month to learn Torah. And it doesn't have an effect on them. They, uh, you know, they, they, they remain the same. So he said he never understood that nature. Why people were unable to respond to having a proper Kovod HaTorah. Uh, both Abaya and Rova emphasize that over and over and over again. That respect for Talmud HaChachomim. Abaya said that in his town they always said to him, what good are the rabbis? You know, they never make anything mutter. They never allow us anything. So what good are they? Maya Hanalei Rabbonin. What good are they? They never said a raven is kosher, right? They have the Supreme Court, then they could say things. What a... It's the creation here of another society, literally another society.
that there'll be, G there'll be a, a, a Jewish society, a Torah society, and there'll be in the others, and the others will eventually disappear. All of Jewish history shows us that. Unable to maintain it. And the Novi says, Okay, Achazir, Varnevis. But they don't get it. Maybe it's our fault that they don't get it. That also could be. But in any event, uh, so uh, Rova is, uh, Rova and Abaye, I, uh, so you say, what good are the rabbis? You know, the rabbis never make anything mutter. You said, they don't understand the, the purpose of the rabbis. They don't understand Torah. They don't appreciate what they have. And therefore, they, they don't know how to treat it. Uh, the difference between Rov and Abaye and previous generations is that previous generations, uh, the study of Torah was to resolve halachot, was to resolve questions of halacha almost exclusively. Rov and Abaye, the reason they appear so many times is because they teach us the joy of study, of study itself, of, the, of Torah itself. In Yiddish, there was a phrase, redden and learning, to talk and learning. You meet a Talmud Chochem, you talk and learning. It has no practical effect. And many times, the thing that you're talking and learning with is about a subject that really has no relevance in our time. We'll talk about the gifts to the priesthood, or we'll talk about uh, the fact that uh, the sacrifices in the temple. Well, none of that has a relevance today. And yet, that's the joy of Torah. The joy of Torah is to be able to speak in learnings, to be able to talk to each other in Torah. That's Abaya and Rova. That's what they represent. They represent that, that greatness. Now, Abaya was a Kohen, as I mentioned. So Abaya, uh, even though he was a poor person, Abaya said uh, in Bovel the custom was that they still gave gifts, uh, priestly gifts, the Matnus Kahuna, they still gave it to the Kohanim in the third century. They were not that far removed from the destruction of the temple, and therefore they still had the custom of giving, uh, let's say, portions of the animal that they slaughtered to the Kohen. Uh, they would g give him gifts of grain and of fruit. So Abayah says, I never took. I never took anything. Because he said, uh, I, when, I, when I studied in the Gemara, I saw that those that took uh, eventually uh, pressured the people to give to them. Bad things came out of it. The Gemara says that uh, those that had chutzpah pushed to take, and the tznuim, those that were modest and humble, moshchim yadeim, they withdrew their hands. They didn't take anymore. So I didn't take either. He said, except once a year, Erev Yom Kippur, I had them bring to me Matnus Kuhuna, the gifts of the Kuhuna, in order to prove that I'm a Kohen. So they shouldn't say he doesn't take the gifts of the Kuhuna because he's not, he's, maybe he's not a real Kohen. Maybe there's a, a uh, disqualification in his pedigree. So once a year, Abaya said I would take, I would take Erev Yom Kippur in order to show that I was a Kohen. When Abaya died, so then they made Rova the Rosh Yeshiva, but Rova didn't want to move to Pumpadisa. Rova already had his Yeshiva established in Machoza, so what happened was that the Yeshiva moved to Machoza. The Yeshiva Pumpadisa moved to Machoza, where it stayed for 14 years until Rova died. Rova died in his uh, middle 70s, and uh, uh, when Rova died, then the yeshiva in Pumpadisa reopened, and the, uh, under, uh, under the Talmudim of Rova and Abaye, and it moved back. But Rova himself lived always in Machoza, and the yeshiva itself moved to Machoza with him. Rova, fascinating story that the Talmud tells, only the Talmud could tell this story. Rova was a son-in-law of Rav Chizda. Rav Chizda was a great Talmud Chacham, and Rav Chizda was a very, very wealthy man. So both, uh, the Gemara tells us that uh, uh, <coughs> Rav Chono and, uh, and Rova were sitting by Rav Chizda and learning. And Rav Chizda had a young daughter, three, four-year-old daughter, 
that was sitting on his lap while he was teaching the shir. And then as a joke, Rav Chizda said to her, you see these two Talmidei Chachomim, which one do you want to marry? So she said, I want both of them. And that's what happened. Rava said, when she said, I want both of them, Rava said, I'll be the second one. And the, what happened was that first she was married to the first one, and when he passed away, then Rava married her. And it is through her that Rava had children, uh, and, uh, and she's mentioned in the Gemara many, many times. She's a very, very famous woman. Uh, there, there are many famous Rebetzins in the Talmud, and she's one of them. She was the daughter of Rav Chizda, and Rav Chizda was a very wealthy man, a powerful man. Rava was his son-in-law, and Rava benefited therefore because Rav Chizda already had all these contacts and already had all uh, the government people that he knew, etc. So Rava just fit right in uh, when he married her. And they had uh, children together, and uh, the Rava's children and grandchildren are mentioned many times in the Talmud. And again, uh, undoubtedly a dynasty that still exists today, uh, the descendants of Rava. But she said, I'd marry both of them, right? And, began, uh, and her words came true that she did marry both of them. She was the wife of both of those Talmudim. Rava uh, attempted uh, to uh, create a uh, Jewish society uh, that would be uh, not only Torah-oriented, uh, but would be protected by the local government. That the local government would give special uh, recognition to uh, the scholars, to the Talmud Chachomim. Now uh, this was a, uh, something that, for instance, under the Romans, the scholars were all in hiding. It was dangerous to be a scholar. It was dangerous to be identified as being uh, a student in the yeshiva because the Romans felt that all of these people were potential traitors, that they were always working uh, for Jewish independence, and that uh, they, their opposition to paganism was so great that they would undermine the Roman rule and the Roman Empire. So the Talmud HaChomim really went into hiding under Roman rule. Here in Bovel, however, not only did the Talmud HaChomim not go into hiding, they demanded and received special privileges from the authorities. For instance, they were exempt from certain taxes uh, that everybody else had to pay. Uh, they received uh, the clergy discount on many things, uh, but they were protected from uh, having to do public service because in all of these countries you had to do some sort of public service, if not the army, but you had to quarter people in your house. Uh, the, if the army came through the town, you had to provide your house uh, that, that people should stay there, etc. Rova gained exemptions for all of these things for the Talmud HaChachamim. And that became a pattern throughout Jewish history. It's a pattern that remains today. That the Talmud Chacham somehow, by virtue of being the Talmud Chacham, is relieved from uh, certain obligations which the rest of the citizenry uh, uh, is obligated to follow. Now how that resonates in modern ears is a different question. But the tradition of it is many, many centuries old and it was always part of uh, Jewish life. Uh, Rava also, uh, because of his relationship with the government, uh, was able to see to it that the, uh, the yeshivas were safeguarded uh, from the non-Jews. People were afraid to start up with the yeshivas, people were afraid to start up with the students of the yeshivas because they knew that uh, the heads of the yeshiva had uh, good connections with the government, had good connections with the police, there would be all sorts of problems. As I mentioned, Rova was in the wine business and he was in the boat business. Now, Rova's wine business was very, very extensive. Jews that were in the wine business almost always had great connections in the non-Jewish community because that's who they sold the wine to in the main part. The Talmud tells us that Rova was an expert in wine and he was an expert in blending wine. So the Talmud tells us that once Rav Yosef, who was blind, 
uh, Rava came to him, Erev Yom Kippur, Rava came to ask his forgiveness on a matter that Rava disagreed with him in Aloha and that uh, Rav Yosef took exception to. He said, if you disagreed with me, then why did you come ask me? Uh, so he felt that Rav Yosef was hurt, so he came to ask his forgiveness on Erev Yom Kippur. But since uh, Rav Yosef couldn't see, so Rava didn't introduce himself right away, but Rava uh, mixed wine for him that he should drink with, his, with the Suda that we, we eat on Erev Yom Kippur. So he meant they drank wine as we drink uh, water or soda. Uh, so he mixed wine for him and he gave him to drink. And Rav Yosef tasted the wine, he said, oh, Rava is here. Because only Rava knows how to mix wine that well. Only Rava is able to, uh, to produce such wine. So Rava was famous uh, in the entire community uh, for, uh, for, for many, many talents. We find that Rava was an expert on all sorts of birds. Uh, Rava went to many times with the hunters to see uh, different creatures. Uh, Rava is a uh, person on the outside uh, that, uh, that, that is looking always at the world and finds enjoyment in it. Nevertheless, the Talmud says that when Rava studied Torah, sometimes he put his hands underneath his haunches when he was studying, and he didn't realize it, and he crushed his fingers till they bled. So great was his power of concentration in Torah that he didn't even realize the pain that he was causing himself where he had put his fingers and that, the, the, and that he bled from it. And uh, Rova also, as I mentioned, suffered from uh, colitis, from, a, uh, from stomach uh, problems all of his life. But again, we don't see it uh, in any of his words or in any reflection of his behavior. So we have here these two great people, Abaya and Rova, who are really the... Uh, the culmination of the greatness of the Talmud and who set the standard for all later generations so that whenever we think of the Talmud we always think of Abaya and Rava, their names resonate within us, uh, they're live today, they, they exist every place a Jew studies the Talmud and because of that therefore they uh, to a great extent are the most beloved of all of the people of the Talmud because we are most familiar with them. And that's why we have so many stories in the Talmud regarding them, because of the fact that they're like guests in our home. We all know them, we all appreciate them, we all deal with them, and therefore that's the greatness that they bring to the Talmud. I want to thank you all for attending this lecture series, and the Mirza Shem uh, will think of something else to do uh, the next time.